Hello Ocean Science, it's great to be with you. Thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, my name's Katie Hill, for those that don't know me. Uh, I have worked within the National Intersac National Systems for a number of years to advance ocean observing. Previously, I worked for the Global Ocean Observing System and the Global Climate Observing System based at the World Meteorological Organization, attempting to use that international machinery to help um, rather than hinder the advancement of observing and previously to that I worked in Australia for the Integrated Marine Observing System. I'm now back in the UK uh, working on bolstering the ocean observing efforts here and uh, leading on the G7 Future of the Seas and Oceans initiative on behalf of the UK. So as you might have realised there won't be fancy plots in this presentation you're just going to have uh, me and, uh, and, and a few quick thoughts before handing over to others. So I think as a, as a community, just in, in, I'm going to start talking in in, in, about ocean observing in general. And I think as a community, we really have to um, applaud the phenomenal achievement of, of getting to where we are and the observing system we have to to date and the, all the work that's gone into building that observing system and and growing it but it is time that we now think about how we tackle the next push and what needs to be the focus and i think recognizing it is important to recognize that the observing system can will and needs to evolve with we're not solely in a growth phase where we're trying to maintain what we're doing and grow and build and build, but we don't have the budgets for that. We've energised the observing system through innovation and we've been very successful in growing the system um, that way and that is a hallmark of success, but we don't have the luxury of those growing budgets and we need to demonstrate that we're observing the ocean smarter and delivering more and uh, we, we that I think is the challenge for the for the next drive. Uh, funding for sustained observing is is fragile I think it's clear to many that we are reliant on a small number of passionate individuals to champion observations which nowadays are used for broad application and we need to evolve the funding model and push for the evolving the funding model for ocean observations so that it is fit for purpose and, re re and reflects how that data is used and that will free, free up many of our uh, scientists to actually then exploit that data rather than chasing grants for something that is used by many. But that will also mean that we need to evolve how we plan and coordinate observations to target investment for broad benefit, and that will require some challenging conversations in terms of where investment is prioritised. Um, so the question is, what is the role of deep of ocean time series and deep water moorings in? Um, a modern observing system. Uh, these, this is expensive technology. I don't have to tell you that relative, um, relatively speaking, um, but also hugely valuable. So it's great to see the discussions um, developing around the ocean sites mission types, and I look forward to, to participating uh, in the in the call today. Um, so I would be interested to see how um, we can articulate what the unique role of ocean sites are in the context of those missions and the complementary capabilities of other platforms, uh, how we can bring uh, innovation in to the mix um, to harness new technologies to either lower costs or de deliver more for investment um, and to strengthen integration with other platforms and with, of course, models. I think increasingly we're thinking about co-design and co-development of observing and prediction systems. 
there are system based reviews which um, in which uh, uh, borings have featured uh, the Tropical Pacific Observing System 2020 project is is one there's been an induced review and, and a tropical Atlantic observing system review also and there are plans afoot for some more global uh, reviews such as uh, one on ocean heat and freshwater storage being led out of OOPC. I, I'm personally hoping we can still find a way to progress work on the sustained observations of boundary currents. Of course, that will be useful as well. Um, so to the transport arrays, uh, what are our requirements in general for tracking transports? That's not just a question for ocean size. That's a question more broadly, but it's one that you can contribute to. And, and how do moorings uniquely contribute to those requirements? Where are the, the arrays particularly needed and why? And that's a useful uh, discussion to uh, engage our, our modelling uh, colleagues on. We, we know that transport data from moorings is, is hugely rich and valuable but it is complex to interpret. Uh, there's probably a, an elite group of experts globally who have that capability. So how do we ensure that we get maximum value from that data and broad benefit and utility? Um, can we package it in a way that's more broadly usable? To what extent is mooring data taken up and used um, in prediction systems? And how I'm not just talking about data assimilation, there are, uh, there, there, there's other steps there too. And how can we improve its usability and utility? Now, I see Bernadette will be talking about the boundary current arrays and the role of moorings in the integrated system. And um, Eleanor will be talking about the pace and scale arrays. So I'll leave them uh, to, to talk about more of the, more of the specifics um, and um, look forward to, to participating in the discussion today. Thank you very much.